important. Also, there is no food or drink allowed in the theater at any time. And now, without further ado, Chaparral House High School proudly presents Neil Simon, The Good Doctor. disturbing me. I would much rather talk than work. Yet here I am, day after day, haunted by a single thought. I must write, I must write, I must write. This is my study, the room in which I write my stories. I made it myself, actually. Cut the timbers, fitted the logs, made an awful mess. I do my writing here at the side of the room because the roof leads directly over my desk. I would move the desk, but it covers a hole I left in the floor. And the floor was built on the side of a hill, so in heavy rains, the whole room tends to slide downhill. Many is the day I stood in this cabin and passed by neighbors standing in the road. Still, I'm happy here, although I don't get enough visitors to suit me. People tend to shy away from writers. They assume we're always busy thinking. Not true. Even my dear old mother doesn't like to disturb me. So she always tiptoes up here and leaves my food outside the door. I haven't had a hot meal in years. Still, I do a good deal of writing in here. Perhaps too much. I look out that window and wonder that life is passing me at the furious rate. So I ask myself the question, what force is it that compels me to write so incessantly? Day after day, page after page, story after story? And the answer is quite simple. I have no choice. I am a writer. Sometimes I think I may be mad. Oh, I'm quite harmless, but I do admit to fits of one. I'm engaged in conversations where I hear nothing and see only the silent movement of lips and answer a meaningless, yes, yes, of course. And all the time I'm thinking, he'll make a wonderful character for a story, this one. Still, while I'm writing, I enjoy it and I like reading the proofs, but as soon as it appears in print, I can't bear it. I see that it's all wrong, a mistake, that it ought never have been written, and I am miserable. And then the people read it. Charming, yes, clever. Charming, but the far cry from Tolstoy. Or, or, a fine thing, yes, but Turgenev's father and sons was better. And so it will be to my dying day. Charming and clever, charming and clever, nothing more. And when I die, my friends will walk by my grave and say, here lies so-and-so. A good writer, but Turgenev was better. 
You know, it's funny, but before you came here, I was thinking to myself, perhaps I should just give it all up. What would I do instead? Well, I've never freely admitted this before, but to you here in the theater tonight, I would like to tell you what it was I always wanted to do with my life. Ever since I was a small child, I always, I always, excuse me a moment, just making a note, an idea just occurred to me, an idea for a short story. Hmm. Yes, yes, it was actually my mentioning the theater that sparked me. What was it we were talking about a moment ago? No matter. My thoughts are consumed with this new idea. See if it appeals to you. It starts in a theater. It starts on the opening night performance of the new season. It starts with the arrival of all those dear and devoted patrons of the arts arriving at the Grand Salon, commenting on how this one looks and how that one is dressed, scarcely knowing what play they're about to see. With the exception of one man, Ivan Ilyich Tretikov. I Ivan Ilyich Tretikov, a civil servant, a clerk in the Ministry of Public Art, had any passion in his life at all, it was the people. He certainly had hopes and ambitions for a higher office, and had dedicated his life to hard work, zeal, and patience. Still, he would not deny himself this one pleasure. So, he purchased two tickets in the very fair section of the theater for the opening night performance of Rostov's The Bearded Countess. As Fortune would have it, into the theater that night came his respected superior, General Nikos Minister of Public Parks himself. Good evening, General. What? Oh, yes. Yes, good evening. Permit me, sir. The name is Churnikov. Ivan Ilyich. It is an honor for me, sir. Yes. Uh, like yourself, dear general, I too serve the Minister of the Public Parks. That is to say, I serve you. Who is indeed himself the Minister of the Public Parks? I am the Assistant Chief Clerk in the Department of Threes and Bushes. Oh, keep up the good work. Lovely Threes and Bushes this time of year. <laughs> Very nice. Uh, my wife would very much like to say hello. This is she. My wife, Madam Churdyukov. How do you do? My pleasure. My pleasure, General. How do you do? Uh, Madam Brasselhoff, my wife, Madam Churdyukov. How do you do, Madam Brasselhoff? How do you do? Well, I just had the pleasure of meeting your husband. And I'm my wife's husband. How do you do, Madam Brasselhoff? Shh, I'm sorry, I'm terribly sorry. I hope you enjoy the place, sir. I will, if I can what? <laughs> feeling quite pleased with himself for having made most of this golden opportunity, Ivan Ilyich Churchikov sat back to enjoy the bearded countess. He was no longer a stranger with the Minister of Public Parks. They had become, if one wanted to be generous about the matter, familiar with each other. But then, quite suddenly, without any warning, like a bolt from a grey, thundering sky, Ivan Ilyich Churchikov reared his head back and... Ah! Ah! Joe! Oh my goodness, I'm so terribly sorry, sir. I'm so sorry. Never mind, it's all right. All right, it's certainly not all right, but it was inexcusable. It was monstrous of me. You make too much of the matter. Let it rest. Let it rest? How can I let it rest? It was unpardonable. Oh, permit me to wipe the back of your neck, sir, if the least I can. God, leave it all be. It's all right, I say. But I splattered you, sir. Your head is completely splattered. It was an accident, I assure you, but. It's disgusting! Shh! I'm sorry, my apologies. The thing is, sir, it came completely without warning. Without my nose before, it could like, shh! It's not the call that that's what you're wondering. Probably about to come down to not. <laughs> but try as he might, Churchikov could not get the incident out of his mind. The sneeze, no more than an innocent anatomical accident grew out of all proportion in his mind until it resembled the angry roar of a cannon aimed squarely at the enemy camp. He played the incident back in his mind, slowing down the procedure so he could view again in horror 
the infamous thief. What? What you? Charming. Yes, charming. Oh, charming. This was charming. Wasn't it charming, my dear? I found it utterly charming. I was completely charmed by it. Excuse me, Excellency. Who's tapping? Somebody's tapping me. Who's that tapping? I'm tapping, sir. I'm the tapper. Turn your call. Stand back here. It's the sneezer. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm all sneezed at. I'm just concerned about your husband going out in the night air with a damn head. That? It was a trick. A mere faux pas. Forget it, young man. Amusing play, don't you think? Did you find that amusing? Amusing? Oh, oh yes! <laughs> Quite amusing! Ha <laughs> ha! So true! Oh, I've loved that honey in years! <laughs> Which part interested you the most? Oh, the sneeze! <laughs> when I sneeze on you, sir, it's a complete accident, I assure you. Forget it, young man. Come, my dear. It looks like rain. I would just want to get my head wet again. You're not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ruined! <coughs> ruined! They'll find me from trees and bushes! They'll send me down to branches and twigs! Oh, what? <laughs> That's not what it concerned me. It was just a harmless little sneeze. The general has probably forgotten it already. Do you really think so? No. I'm scared, Yvonne. <laughs> and so they walked home in despair. Perhaps if I were to send the general a nice gift, perhaps some Turkish towels, Sherdikov's once promising career had literally been blown away. <laughs> Why did this have to happen to me? Why did I go to the theater then at all? Why did I just sit in the balcony with all the other people were in class? They love to sneeze on each other. <laughs> perhaps if I were to explain matters again, but in such a charming, confident, and self-effacing manner, he'd have no choice but to forgive me. Maybe it's best not to remind him, Yvonne. No. If I expect to become a gentleman, I must learn to act like one. And so the next morning came. It so happened that this was the day the general listened to petition. And since there were 50 or 60 petitions ahead of Churchill, he waited from morning till late, late afternoon. Next. Next! Oh, I'm not next, Your Excellency. I'm last. Very well. Last! Oh, that's me, sir! Well, <laughs> what is your petition? I have no petition, sir. I'm not the petitioner. Then you waste my time. Uh, do you not recognize me, Your Excellency? In the class night, but rather explosive circumstances, I'm the, uh... The what? The sneezer! The one who sneezed, the sneezing splatterer. Indeed. And what is it you want now? I got so tight? <laughs> no! <laughs> Your forgiveness. I just wanted to point out that there was no political or any social motivation behind my sneeze. It was non-partisan, non-violent act of God. I cursed it and put your brain forced itself on my face. It's a hateful nose, sir, and I am not responsible for its indiscretions. Punish that which has committed the crime, but the dull, hidden, and body be haunted. Exile my nose, but forgive me, your judge. Forgive me. My dear I am not angry with your nose. I am far too busy to have time for your nasal problems. I suggest you go home and take a hot bath. Or a cold one. Take something. But do not bother me with this silly business again. Jibber, jibber, jibber. That's all I've been hearing all day. Jibber, 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 jibber. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And your wife. And your household. May your days be sweet. And may your nights be better than your days. The feeling of relief that came over Churchill was enormous. Oh, may the birds sing in the morning at your window. And may the coffee in your cup be strong and hot. The weight of the burden that was lifted was inestimable. Oh, I wish of you and the chair that you sit on in the uniform you wear sits on the chair that I worship. He walked home, singing and whistling like a lark. Life surely was a marvel, a joy, a heavenly paradise. Gold, I'm happy. And yet, and yet, as he arrived home, he began to think. Have I been the butt of a cruel, thoughtless joke? Had the minister told you? If he had no intention of punishing me, why did he torture me so? 
and mercilessly. If the sneeze meant so little to the general, why did he deliberately cause Churchikov to writhe in his bed? To twist in agony the entire night? Churchikov was furious! I am furious! He fought and fumed through the night, and in the morning he called to his wife, Sonia! Ah! <laughs> Have been humiliated! Do we, Bob? Who could humiliate you? <laughs> You're such a kind and generous person. Who? I'll tell you who. General Brassov, the minister of the public parks. What did he do? The swine! He humiliated me in such a subtle fashion it was almost indiscernible. His cunning is only equal to his cruelty. He practically forced me to come to his office and grovel and beg on my knees. I was reduced to enduring it. You were that reduced? I must go back and tell him what I think of him. The lower class must be taught, so the world must be made safe, so that all men of all nations and creeds, regardless of color or religion, shall be free to sneeze on their superiors. It does not need to be humiliated by I. The next morning, Churchill came to humiliate me. Last. Well, 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 you say? Do you not recognize me, Your Excellency? Look at my face. Yes, yes, you're quite correct. It is I once again. It is you once again who? Shake your cup, Your Excellency. And I've returned without taking a hot bath nor a cold one. Hey, who let this filthy man in? <laughs> what is it? What is it? What is it, you ask? You sit there behind your desk and ask, what is it? You sit there as general and minister of the public parks. A member of high standing among the upper class, and ask me, a lowly civil servant, what is it? You sit there with full knowledge that there is no equality in this life. There are those of us that serve, and those of us that are served. Those that obey, and those that are obeyed. Those that bow, and those that are bowed to. That there are certain events in this life that cause some of us to be humiliated, and others that are the cause of that humiliation. And still, you ask, what is it? What is it? Don't just stand there gibbering like an idiot. What is it that you want? I'll tell you what I want. I want to do apologize again for sneezing on you. <laughs> I want to show my medicare the first time I was an accident, so I assure you. Out! Out, you idiot. Fool. Imbecile. Get out of my sight. I never want to see you again. If you ever cross my line of vision, I'll have you exiled forever! What's your name? Sh Shadak too! <laughs> you... You germ spreader! <laughs> you maggot! You insect! You are lower than an insect! You are the second cousin of a cockroach! <laughs> the son-in-law of a bedbug! The nephew of a ringworm! You are nothing. Nothing. Do you hear me? Nothing! <laughs> At that moment, something broke loose inside the dirty car. Something so deep, so vital, so organic. The damage that was done seemed irreparable. What could only be described as the very life force itself was drained from him. The matter was over. For once, for all, forever. What happened next was quite simple. Ivan Ilyich Shurtikov went home, took off his coat, lay down on the sofa, and died. <laughs> by life's cruelty, there is an alternate death. Ivan Ilyich Shurdikov went home, took off his coat, lay down on the sofa, and inherited five million rubles. I assure you, it is not my intention to paint life any harsher than it is. However, some of us are indeed trapped. Witness the predicament of a young government who 
cares for and educates the children of a well-to-do family. Julia! Tracking. Julia!
So that means another five rubles off. Ah, yes. The 16th of January, I gave you 10 rubles. You didn't, <laughs> but I made a note of it. Why would I make a note of it if I didn't give it to you? I don't know, ma'am. That's not a satisfactory answer, Julia. Why would I make a note of giving you 10 rubles if I did not, in fact, give it to you, eh? No answer! Then I must have given it to you, mustn't I? Yes, ma'am. You, you do say so. Well, I certainly say so. That's the point of this little talk, to clear these matters up. Take 27 from 41, that leaves... 14, correct? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> What's this? Tears? Are you crying? Has something made you unhappy, Julia? Oh, please tell me. It pains me to see you this way. I'm so sensitive to tears. What is it? Only once since I've been here have I ever been given any money. And that was by your husband. On my birthday, he gave me three rubles. Really? There's no note of it in my book. I'll put it down now. Three rubles. Thank you for telling me. Sometimes I'm a little lax with my accounts. Always short changing myself. Take three more from 14 leaves. 11! Do you wish to check my figures? There is no need to, ma'am. Then we're all settled. Here's your salary for two months, dear. 11 rubles. Count it. <laughs> it's not necessary, ma'am. Come, come, let's keep the record straight. Count it.
Julia was so enraged by such cruel and unjust treatment that she quit her job on the spot and went back to her poor parents, where she inherited five million rubles. <laughs> write a book of 37 short stories, all with that same ending. I do love it so. <laughs> you know, it has been said that man is the only living creature capable of laughter. And it is this faculty that separates us from the lower forms of life. However, one must wonder about this theory when we examine some of the objects of our laughter. For example, pain. Pain. Needless to say, is no laughing matter. Unless, of course, it is someone else who is doing the suffering. <laughs> Why, the sight of a man in the throes of excruciating agony from an abscessed tooth that has enlarged his jaw to the size of an orange is funny. I couldn't say it isn't funny, not in the slightest. However, in the village of Astempo, where they have very little access to entertainment, a man with a toothache can tickle their ribs for weeks. Certainly, the sexton, Sergei Bully Glassov, saw nothing humorous about him. And yet, as he walked through the village on his way to the hospital, his moans and groans won him more chuckles than sympathetic remarks. Wouldn't they find it even more humorous to know that the good doctor, who usually performed the extractions of angry teeth, was away at the wedding of his daughter, and the duty fell to his new assistant, courteous and eager messenger? If, alas, the poor sexton, an inexperienced one. Oh, oh. Greetings, father. But, but brings you here. The pain is unbearable. It is beyond unbearable, it is unendurable. Oh, there oh. exactly is the pain. Oh, there isn't it. <laughs> Everywhere. It's not just the truth, it's the whole side of my mouth. How long have you had this, sir? Agony? Ten years. Ten years? Since yesterday morning. <laughs> it seems like ten years. Oh, I must have sinned terribly to deserve this. God must have dropped all of this business to punish me this way. <sighs> Where is the doctor? The dog, oh, the doctor is away on personal business. Uh, he left the care of his patients in my young brother. Capable hands. But are you a doctor? In every way. Except a degree. <laughs> I am a doctor to be. And I am a patient to be goodbye. <laughs> I can assure you the only thing that prevents me from being called doctor is the formality of an examination. I'm skilled, I'm just not titled. Please, I beg you for this opportunity. Please, sit in the chair, Father. And help me today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, even sitting hurts. Oh, oh, oh. oh. oh no doubt the nerves are inflamed. Oh. Uh, once removed, the pain will cease to be. You're going to remove the nerves? Uh, the tooth that's connected to the nerve. It's a simple matter of surgery. Who's <laughs> a cigar? What? Your cigar is burning my eyes. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you rather I put it out? I only smoke it to steady my nerves. Smoke it, smoke the cigar. <laughs> oh, oh, ah, 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 oh, 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 oh. There. Now let's see what we have here. I pray for you. I pray to our saints and to our dear Lord in heaven, be gentle with me, spare me pain. Oh, my dear Saxton, we are living in an age of advanced science. In skilled hands, there is no longer need for pain. If it's gentleness you want, it's gentleness oh. you'll get. Oh. Now, are you ready? Good. Now please open your mouth so I can examine you. Come, come, open your mouth. Please. My dear Sexton, inexperienced as I am, I know it's essential for you to open your mouth. It is mandatory to all work concerning the mouth to have done it first. 
It would be highly impractical for me to pull your tool from the outside. <laughs> now, please open up. <laughs> Not me lips, the entire mouth. I don't want to brush your teeth, I want to examine them. We'll let you be gentle. Didn't I promise you I would? As a child, I was promised many things I never got. <laughs> no pain connected to this part. This part is merely an examination to find out what must be done, where, and how. Now open up. Good, good, now let's have a look. Ah! Yes, there it is. <laughs> There's the uh, ugly little fellow. You're a nasty one, aren't you? Stop talking to it! Don't make friends with it! Pull it out! Don't brush me! I'm evaluating! Oh. 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 Your tooth has a hole in it big enough to drive a horse and a carriage through. <laughs> what is it? It's disgusting to even look at. <laughs> but if this is going to be my profession, I have to get used to these kinds of things. Now, I am going to try something. Be gentle. As though I were your own mother. My mother didn't like me gentler. All I'm going to do is uh, gently blow on the tooth. Oh, that's all. That's all. All right. Excuse me. <laughs> Here it goes. Oh! oh! I have some information for you, but the nerve is exposed. Is this how far science has advanced blowing on teeth? It's still inconclusive. Oh, more work must be done in this field of study. So much depends on the temperature of the doctor's breath. The tooth has to be pulled. It'll be out quicker than you can speak. Oh, merciful God! Oh, surgery <laughs> is nothing. It's all a matter of a firm hand. I pray for you. May the Lord enlighten your soul. May he give you help and quickness. Mostly quickness. Uh, ah. Ah. Oh, oh, this will turn cut out easy. Some teeth give you trouble, I admit, but that's only when the roots are deep. I hope you break your shallow roots. <laughs> hey! Don't do that! Don't! Don't grab my hand! Let go! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I got my hand again. Are you going to let go of my hand? Because if you don't let go of my hand, I'm going to take these forceps and pull your fingers out!
Oh, I knew it. Oh. The crown broke. Oh, you're still in your mouth. Oh, what a mess this is going to be. You. But how do you come again? Your God spent it for my sins. Compared to you, he told it was a giant. You ignorant peasant. Oh. The only thing harder than the roots in your mouth are the brains in your head. Now, get back in the chair. We have unfinished business. Keep away, sorceress! If you stick your fingers in my mouth, it'll be the first solid food I eat this week! You are not leaving here until the fruits are not! It's a question of professional pride!
Do you have the time of day? Eh, the scary time of peace. Ah, no matter. This wasn't urgent. My business can wait. Yes, it can wait. So this old man Growing, perhaps. Seducing is not for you. 
<laughs> now, in order to seduce another man's wife, you must, I repeat, must keep as far away from her as possible. Pay her practically no attention at all. Ignore her if you must. We will get to her through the eyes. You are about to witness a practical demonstration. For as it happens, I am madly and deeply in love. This week. <laughs> Peter 
Peter Semyonich, the batch. We met them in the gardens. That attracted them. You remember? I remember what a loathsome man is. You may not think so when you hear what he had to say about you. Nothing that Dragon had to say would interest you. He spoke most enthusiastically about you. He was enraptured by your grace, your quiet charm, and he seemed to feel that you were capable of loving a man some extraordinary way. There was something about your eyes and the way you looked so adoring. He certainly had a lot to say about you. You went on and on. Good night, my dear. Good night. What else? Hmm? What else did you have to say about him? Peter? What else did you have, Peter Simeone have to say about him? Well, that's more or less it. It's what I told you. But he said he went on and on. He did. But we stopped if he went on and on and go on and on and let's go to bed. But he said how much he envied me. How much he wanted someone to look at him the way you look at me. How does he know how I look at him? Well, that day in the gardens, he must have been looking at you when you were looking at me. He said a tingle through my whole body. The way I looked at you? Exactly. But you were looking at him, so you couldn't have seen the way I was looking at you. As a matter of fact, I was looking at the flowers and made me so nervous the way he kept avoiding looking at him. He must have tingled for some other reason. It's getting rather confusing. <laughs> the point is, you found me fascinating. I thought that would please you. Well, it doesn't. I was glad that you didn't tell me such stories. Are you planning on seeing him again soon? Tomorrow, for lunch. Well, I would rather not be discussed over lunch. Tell him that. And at dinner, you can tell me what he said. Good night. Good night, my angel. Good night, my love! <laughs> by some young, wealthy prince to paint the head of a typical Russian beauty. He asked me to keep a lookout for a model. I told him I knew just the woman, but I didn't dare ask her myself. What do you think about asking your wife? Asking my wife what? To be the model, of course, that lovely head of hers. It would be a damn shame if that exquisite face missed the chance to be immortalized for all the world. For all the world? Really? Hmm, I see what you mean. Why don't you discuss it, though? Good idea. I'll discuss it. So I said I would discuss it with you. What do you think? I think it's nonsense. Did he actually put it that to wait to you a typical Russian beauty? Precisely. And that it would be a damn shame if that exquisite face missed the chance to be immortalized for all the world. And that's exactly what he said. He does get carried away by his own voice. But that's exactly what he said. You didn't leave anything out. Oh yes, that lovely face. I left out that lovely face. <laughs> he said that a number of times, I think. But <laughs> one enough. It's hard to remember. No, it's not important. But in the future, I wish you would write these things down. Have you seen me near her? Have you heard me speak to her? Has any correspondence passed between us? No, my dear pupils. And yet she aims on to every word uttered by her husband. Awesome, isn't it? We apply this treatment for two to three weeks. A resistance is weakening, weakening, weakening. Mind goes elsewhere, if you ask me, on some woman from the looks of it. What woman? Has he mentioned any woman in particular? Oh, no, he's too discreet for that. He would protect a good name at any cost. Instead, he talks of you all day. Poor fool, I'm beginning to feel sorry for him. It's really none of our concern with you. Are you planning on seeing him soon? He's busy for lunch tomorrow. Busy after that, then? Busy. Next week, next month, what does the he says he's involved in a very important project, and it'll be weeks before he can see us. He did say, with patience and persistence, good things will come to him. <laughs> By the way, who thinks you should go on the stage? This came to me on the stage, why are you having Well, he said, uh, just a moment, I don't want to misquote him. <laughs> he said, with such an attractive appearance, such intelligence, sensitiveness, it's a sin for her to be just a housewife. Dear, he said all of that? And that ordinary demands don't exist for such women. Nikki, I don't think I'd want to hear it anymore. Nature's like that, talking about my time and space. Nikki, I thought you please stop. And then he said, if I were so busy, I'd take her away from you. <laughs> oh. He said uh, Yes, right there. Nikki, it's very important to me that you tell him what you said to him then. Well, I said take her. I'm not going to have a do over or anything. <laughs> My love, 
He's the one who always brings up the subject. He actually accused me of not understanding him. He shouted at me. She's an exceptional creature. Strong. Seek no way up. I would dig in I'll put in a number. Passionate danger. The man is weird. Definitely weird. <laughs> The sweet poison is doing its work. I am relentless. There is no room for mercy in the seducing business. <laughs> now, observe how deftly the final stroke is administered. For the faint of heart that I urge you, look away. <laughs> <laughs> no, not another word for me, not the AP. But exactly, that's what he said. He begged me to tell you nothing. He said he knew because of your sweet, sympathetic nature, you would only worry to hear of someone else's distress. He's in distress? No, worse. He's gloomy, morose, morbid, in the depths of despair. But why? What's the matter with him? Loneliness. He says he has no relatives, no true friends, not a soul who understands But does he know how much I... We understand him. Does he know how much I... We appreciate the interview with him daily. Does he know how much I... We your interview with him, you and I. I tried to make that clear. I again urged him to come home to dinner. <clears throat> but... He said he can't face people. He's so depressed, he can't stay home. He paces in the public garden where we met him every night. What time? Uh, between eight and nine. <laughs> <laughs> Is eight o'clock all right with you? No, I have to visit Aunt Sophia tomorrow. She's ill. I'll be back around nine. <laughs> Possibly. 
especially on occasions where some dashing young officer tells him how attractive he finds his lovely young wife. <laughs> like a cascading fountain. And tonight, nothing. And still I have the urge to write. Something will come, never fear, always does. These things happen to many in my profession all the time. Writer's book, they call it. No need to panic, it will pass soon. Wait! Wait! Hold on! An idea is coming! Yes! Yes! <laughs> Terrible! <laughs> idea, false alarm! Sorry I disturbed you. Not only was it a terrible idea, but I've written it before. It turned out awful. This will last long. It's just temporary. However, it's getting to be a very long, temporary. Nothing is coming, my nerves are tightening. Oh God, help me! No, no, I take that back. I must rely on a collaboration with the Almighty. What selfishness to ask God to take the time out to help me come up with an idea for a story. Forgive me, dear Lord. I will go home and try to get some sleep. Tomorrow is another day. If, however, anything does come to you during the night, I would appreciate it if you make it known to me. Even if it's just the germ of an idea, it doesn't have to be original. I'm very clever at twisting things around. <laughs> Look how desperate I've become. Asking the Lord to resort to plagiarism for my pet <laughs> Oh, I must stay home and bed before this becomes serious. You, sir. Can I you, sir? Fair. I can't see you in the dark. Evening, sir. I was wondering, sir, if you might be in the mood for a little, uh, entertainment this fine evening. Entertainment? I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> sure you do, sir. Entertainment. Amusement, so to speak. A little diversion, if you know what I mean. I think I do know what you mean. And I'm not interested. Go on, off with you. You do no better than to make such a proposal to a gentleman. You've never witnessed anything like this before, that I promise you. This is a once in a lifetime offer. You sure you're not even a little bit curious? Curiosity is the nature of my profession, but I try to keep it morally elevated. Excuse me. Perhaps you're right, sir. On second thought, this might be too much for a gentleman of your sensitivities. Wait! Got you the lesson, didn't I? <laughs> I'm just asking, mind you, but uh, just exactly what is this 
entertainment you speak of. Well, sir, how would you like to see a drowned man? <laughs> I beg your pardon. A drowned man. A man of his lungs filled of the salt water and stone dead from drowning. Now, how much did you pay to see that? Pay? Pay to see a drowned man? Are you insane? I wouldn't look at a drowned man if they paid me. Why would I want to look at the drowned man? What's the point in seeing a man who's drowned? You are mad! Get out of here! Three rubles, sir, that's all to cost you. Three rubles to see him first before he is in the water, then in the agonizing act of drowning, and then the grand finale. The man already drowned. Rest his soul. <laughs> what are you saying? That the man isn't drowned yet? That he's still alive and well? Not only alive and well, but dry as a bone and standing before you. I am the drowned man, sir. You! You are going to drown yourself for three rubles. You expect to charge me for your own suicide? <laughs> I must get away from this room. No, 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 you got it all wrong, sir. I don't actually drown. I impersonate the drowned man. I jump into the icy cold water, splash around a bit, flail my arms, yell for help a few times, I go under, bubble, 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 I come a floating head down off puppy like. It sends a chill up your spine. Three doubles for individual performances in special rates for groups. Just that is two minutes. I can't believe I'm actually discussing the price of admission to a drowning! You missed the whole point, sir. This is not some sort of cheap thrill. It is a rich tab law for the social implication. A drama not tragic, but ironical in view of its comic features. Comic? What is comic about it? I blow my cheeks and bulge my eyes out. Yell for help in a high, stupid voice. Sounds like a big squealing. <laughs> Do you actually expect me to pay to hear an underwater pig squealer? <laughs> Very successful season, sir. Sold out in August. So what do you say, sir? Would you like me to book you now for the dinner show? What do you mean, dinner show? I jump in, flail around, and throw you a nice fish. I think the halibuts are ready now, sir. <laughs> Why do I stand here listening to this? I wish you'd make up your mind, sweet, sir. In five minutes, that restaurant throws its garbage in the water. Then it is messy. I have my pride. <laughs> to hell with your pride! It doesn't prevent you from making a living imitating a deceased swimmer! You sure know how to stay with a man's vulnerable points! <laughs> that was cruel, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be cruel. You completely overlooked the finer points of my profession. Look here, you ever see a coal miner at the end of a day, filthing grime all over his body, soot up his nostrils and in his ears, black grit in his teeth? Disgusting. Or a barber who goes home and with the cuttings of other people's hair sticking to his hands? It gets in his bread, in his soup, it's nauseating. Do you know where a surgeon puts his fingers? Oh, please! <laughs> Every man who eventually catches some spilly. On the other hand, I deal with water. Water is wet, it's clean, it's a beyond mine. I don't have to take a bath when I get home at night, I have take a diet. Can you say the same, sir? Do you actually expect me to discuss my toilet habits with you? My god, you're infuriating! There must be a carriage around you. Cabby! Cabby! You'll regret it. You'll be back one night, bored to death, and dying to see a good drowning. And I'll be gone. This is my last week here. I close on Sunday. Next week, I'm in the Alta. Look, there's an officer there. Now, if you don't leave me alone, I'll have you arrested for soliciting. I'm not soliciting! I'm in the maritime entertainment business. Drowning is not maritime entertainment! <laughs> You're a waterfront lunatic! Officer! Officer! I'm going, I'm going. I'll tell you one thing, the drowning business isn't what it used to be. Can I tell you <laughs> Yes, there is a man behind the docks, there. He's been pestering me all evening. I wouldn't be surprised if you were deranged. A lot of bad characters wandering around this dock at night, sir. A gentleman like you shouldn't be wandering around here. What was he pestering you about? Now, I'm warning you. You're going to find this a bit strange. He wanted to charge me three rubles to watch him drown. Can you imagine? Strange? That's outright thievery. It's not worth more than 60 kopecks. You can get as fine a drowning as you want to see and not pay a penny more. Three rubles. What nerve, officer, you seem to miss the point. There's two brothers from next year. For one ruble each of you, you're a double drowning. You have to know how to bargain with this man, sir. Get your money's worth. It's not the question of price. Three rubles. Why, just over there, the other day, 14 men acted out an entire shipwreck for three rubles. 
For ten rubles, you can get the whole navy going down. Sixty complex. Yes, sir. That's all I pay for the good drowning. Nice, sir. And have a nice evening. It's come. It's finally come. The day the world has gone mad has arrived at last. <laughs> I see the officer is gone. <laughs> I told him the truth, that you were mentally unbalanced. Unfortunately, he was a little more mentally unbalanced than you are. <laughs> Still, I appreciate you not causing me any trouble, and in gratitude, I am reducing my price to an all-time low. 80 kopecks. 80? 80? You thief! You connive, deceiving, wretched little thief! I won't pay more than 60. 60? 60 kopecks for the drowning? But where's my profit? My towels cost me 40 kopecks, and another 40 for the fellow who fishes me out. I'd be losing money on it. What's the point? I might as well stay under. You can't cheat me, sir. Sixty kopecks for the drowning. Take it or leave. You're a hard man, sir. A hard man indeed. Sixty kopecks it is. I pray to God my son doesn't want to be a drowner. <laughs> Thirty, forty, fifty, sixty. There's your money. Now where shall I stand? Right on the edge of the dock, sir. Right up close. That's when you'll see all the action. It's a bit dark there. Are sure I will be able to see well. That is what makes it so eerie. The eerie and the more entertaining. All the actions in the last ten seconds, anyway. Well, <laughs> here I go. I almost forgot. When I come up for the third time, yell at the top of your lungs, Pomnichevsky! Pomnichevsky! Who's Pomnichevsky? He's the fellow who jumps in after me. I can't swim, sir. <laughs> you can't swim! Are you trying to tell me you're going to drown without knowing how to swim? That's what makes it so exciting. Paul <laughs> just always makes the very last second before jumping in and pulling me out. He's in that restaurant, sir, having a drink. Paul Nichevsky, don't forget the name, sir. Well, I hope you enjoy the show. And if you like it, tell your friends. <laughs> in the soup, as we say. <laughs> I don't want to see that part anymore. I don't have all night. Can you drown now? <laughs> Can you drown now? Where will you see? Oh, there you are. Well, that's the third time, isn't it? Good heavens. What was that fellow's name again? <laughs> Please. Next actress, please. Name. What? Your name. Oh, Nina. Nina. Is that it? Just Nina? Yes, sir. No, sir. Nina Nikolonia Zrechnia. Age. My age. Yes, please. Well. That means, how old are you? Well, how old are you looking for? Couldn't you answer the question simply, please? Yes, but I just wanted to let you know I can be any age you want. 16, 30. In my school, I played a 78-year-old woman with rheumatism, and everyone said it was very believable. A 79-year-old rheumatic woman told me herself. Yes, but I'm not looking for a 78-year-old rheumatic woman. I'm looking for a 22-year-old girl. Now, how old are you? 22, sir. Really? I would have guessed 27 or 28. I have a bad head cold, sir. It makes me look older. Last year when I had influenza, the doctor thought I was 39. I promise I can look 22 when you need it, sir. Do you have a temperature? Yes, sir. 103. Good God! What are you doing walking around in the dead of winter with a 103 temperature? Go home, child. Go to bed. You can come back some other time. Oh no, please sir, I've waited six months to get this audition. I've waited three months just to get on the six month waiting list. If they put me on the end of that list again, I'll have to wait another six months, and by then I'll be 23 and it'll be too late to be 22. Please, let me read, sir. 
I'm feeling much better. I think I'm down to 101 now. <laughs> I can see you have your heart set on being an actress. My heart, my soul, my very breath, the bones in my body, the blood in my veins. Yes, yes. We've had enough of your medical history. <laughs> what practical experience have you had? As what? Well, for example, the thing we're discussing. Acting. How much acting experience have you had? You mean on the stage? That's as good a place as any. Well, I studied three years under Madame Zablitska. She teaches here in Moscow? No, in my school, in Odessa. But she was a very great actress herself. Here in Moscow? No, in Odessa. You are then, strictly speaking, an amateur? Yes, sir. In Moscow, in Odessa, I'm a professional. Yes, that's all very well. But you see, we need a 22-year-old professional actress in Moscow. Odessa, although I grant you a lovely city, theatrically speaking, is not Moscow. I would advise you to get more experience and take some aspirin. I walked four days to get here, sir. Won't you just hear me read? My dear child, I find this very embarrassing. Even if you did not employ me, just to read for you would be a memory I would cherish for all of my life. If I may be so bold, sir, I think that you are one of the greatest living authors in all of Russia. Really? That's very kind of you. Perhaps we do have a few minutes. I've read almost everything you've written. The articles, the stories. I love the one about... <laughs> the one about... Oh dear God, every time I think of it, I can't control myself. <laughs> really? Really? Which story is that? The death of a government clerk. Oh dear God, I laughed for days. Death of a govern... I don't remember that. What was that about? Cherchikov? The sneeze? <laughs> the sneezing splatterer? Oh, yes. You found it funny, did you? Strange. I meant it to be sad. Oh, it was sad. I cried for days. It was tragically funny. Was it really? And of everything you read, what was your favorite? My very favorite. Yes, what was it? Tolstoy's War and Peace. I didn't write that. I know, sir, but you asked me what my favorite was. Well, you're an honest little thing, aren't you? It's refreshing. Irritating. But refreshing. <laughs> Very well. What are you going to read for me? I should like to read from the three sisters. Indeed. Which sister? All of them. If you have a time. All of them? Good heavens. Why don't you read the entire play while you're at it? Oh, thank you, sir. I know it all. <laughs> Act one. A drawing room in the Prozorov's house. It's midday. A bright sun is shining through the large French door. That's not necessary. An excerpt to do nicely. Thank you. I would like to do the last moment of the play. Good, good. That shouldn't take too long. Whenever you're ready... I've been ready for six months. Not counting the three months I waited to get on the six-month waiting list. Please, begin. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, sir, could you please say... ta da da boom the sit on the curb if I may. Certainly not. Why would I say such an idiotic thing? I don't know, sir. You wrote it. Chevikin says it at the end of the play. It would help me greatly if you could just read that one line. I waited six months, sir. I walked all the way from Odessa. All right, all right. Very well, then. Ready? Yes, sir. Ta-ra-ra, boom the air. Sit on the curb if I may. And Masha says. Oh, listen to that music. They are leaving us. One has gone for good, forever. We are left alone to begin our lives over again. We must live, we must live. And Irina says, a time will come when we will all know what this is for. Why, there is all this suffering and there will be no mysteries, but meanwhile we must live. We must work, only work. Tomorrow I shall go alone and I shall teach in school and give my whole life to those who need. Now it is autumn. Soon winter will come and cover everything with snow. And I shall go on working. Working. Shall I finish? Please. And Olga says, The music plays so gaily, so valiantly, one wants to live. Oh my God. Time shall pass and we shall be gone forever. We'll be forgotten. Our faces will be forgotten. Our voices. And how many there were of us. But our sufferings will turn into joy for those who led after us. Happiness and peace will come to this earth, and then they will remember kindly and bless those who are living there. 
Oh, my dear sisters, it seems as if just a little more and we shall know why we live, why we suffer. If only we knew. If only we knew. Thank you, sir. You made me very happy. That's all I wanted. God bless you, sir. Will someone go get her before she walks all the way back to Odessa? <laughs> Counts is acting up again and my nerves are like little firecrackers. The least little friction could set them off. Must be very painful, sir. Combing my hairs this morning was agony. <laughs> oh, Mr. Kitten, what is it, Pochatkin? <coughs> There's a woman who insists on seeing you. Can't make her tell her story, but she insists on seeing the direct manager. Perhaps you're not well. No, no. This business of the bank comes before my own minor physical ailments. Sure, and please, quietly. Good morning, madam. Uh, forgive me for not standing, but uh, I'm somewhat incapacitated. Uh, please, sit down. Thank you. Now, what can I do for you? You can help me, sir. I pray to God that you can help. No one else in this world seems to care. Calm <laughs> ah! yourself, madam. I beg of you. Please, calm yourself. I I'm sorry. I'm sure we can sort it all out if we approach the matter sensibly and quietly. Ah, uh, now, uh, what what is the nature of this matter? Well, oh, sir, it's my husband, Collegiate Assessor Shuki. He's been sick for five months now. Five agonizing I, months! I, I know the horrors of illness and can sympathize with you, madam. Uh, what is the nature of his illness? It's a nervous disorder. Everything grates on his nerves. If you so much as touch him, he'll scream out, Ah! <laughs> How <laughs> bloody he How did nobody know? I, I have an inkling. Uh, a little less descriptively, if possible. Well... While the poor man was lying. Oh, uh, you're not going to scream again, are you? Not that I don't have cause. <laughs> While he was lying in bed, recuperating these five months, he was dismissed from his job for no reason at all. That's a pity matter, or er, pity, madam, certainly, but I don't quite see the connection with our bank. You don't know how I suffer during his illness. I noticed him from morning till night, doctored him from night to morning. Besides cleaning my house, taking care of my children, feeding our dog, our cat, our goat, my sister's bird. Is the bird was sick? My sister. <laughs> she gets dizzy spells. She's been dizzy a month now, and she's getting dizzier every day. Extraordinary, how I have to take care of her children, and her house, and her cat, and her goat, and then her bird gets one of my children, and so our cat gets her bird, and so my daughter, the one with the broken arm, drowned my sister. So now my sister wants my goat in exchange, or else, she says, she'll either drown my cat or break my oldest daughter's other arm. Yes, well, you certainly had your pack of troubles, haven't you? But I don't quite see... And then, when I went to get my husband's pay, they deducted 24 rubles and 36 kopecks. For what, I asked? Because they said he borrowed it from me employees. Possible. He could never borrow anything without my approval. I break his arm. <laughs> no, no, they can borrow. I don't have the strength. I'm not too well myself, so I have this racking cough that they terrible thing to hear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can well understand why 
I took your husband five months to recuperate, but uh, what is it you want from me, madam? Ah, what rightfully belongs to my husband? It's plenty for no balls and maybe six go bets. They won't give it to me because I'm a woman. Weak and defenseless. Some of them have laughed in my face. Or At all. However, madam, I do not wish to be unkind, but I'm afraid you've come to the wrong place. Your petition, no matter how justified, has nothing to do with us. You'll have to go to the agency where her husband was employed. What do you mean? <laughs> I've been to five agencies already, and none of them will even listen to my petition. I'm about to lose my mind. My head is falling out of my head. Ah! Please, madam, keep your hand in its proper place. <laughs> now, listen to me carefully. This is a bank. A bank. We are in the banking business. Uh, the bank money. Funds that are brought here are banked by us. Do you understand what I'm saying? What are you saying? I'm saying that I can't help you. No. Are you saying that you can't help me? I'm trying, I don't think making headway. Are you saying you won't believe my husband is sick? Ah! Yeah! Yeah! It's a doctor's certificate! There's the proof! Now, do you still doubt my husband is suffering from a nervous disorder? Not only do I not doubt it, I would swear to it. <laughs> Look at it! You didn't look at it! It's really not necessary. I know full well how your husband must be suffering. <laughs> What's the point in a doctor's certificate if you don't look at it? Look at it! Oh! Oh, yes! Uh, your husband is sick. It says right here on the doctor's certificate. Well, you certainly have a good case, madam, but I'm afraid you've still come to the wrong place. Oh, oh I'm getting excited. <laughs> you lied to me! I took you as a man of your word and you lied to me. I? Ah, and you said you read the doctor's certificate. You couldn't have. You couldn't have read the description of my husband's illness without seeing he was fired unjustly. Don't take advantage of me because I'm a weak defenseless woman. <laughs> Do me the simple courtesy of reading the doctor's certificate. That's all I ask. Read it and then I'll go. But I read it. What's the point in reading something twice when I already read it once? Carefully. I read it in detail. Then you read it too fast. Read it slower. I don't need to read it slower. I'm a fast reader. Maybe you didn't absorb it. <laughs> what did you get this time? I absorbed it. It sank in. I could pass a test on what was written here. But it doesn't make any difference because it has nothing to do with our bank. Did you read it? <laughs> Get her out of here! Who let her in my office? 
You're the sir, I asked you such a hurry. I thought you meant a human being, not a lunatic with a doctor's certificate. He didn't even read it. I gave it to him, he threw it back in my face. You seem like a kind person. Have pity on me. You read it and see if my husband is sick or not. I read it, madam, twice. Me too, I read it. Are you ready twice too? You showed it to me outside. You showed it to everyone. We already see the seat of man. You just looked at it. You didn't read. Don't argue. Read it, put on. Get for God's sakes. Read it so we can get her out of here. Oh, yes, it says your husband is sick. Now, please leave, madam, or I'll have to get someone to remove you. Yes! Don't get the doorman and hold the guard. Be careful, she's strong as an ox. If you touch me, I'll scream so loud, they'll hear it all over the city. You'll lose all your depositors. No one will come to a bank where they beat wigs, defenseless women. I think I'm going to bring a bank! Weak! Defenseless! You are as defenseless as a charging rhinoceros! You are as weak as the king of the jungle! You are a plague, madam! A plague that wipes out all that cross in your path! You are a, a raging river that washes away bridges and stately homes! You are a wind that blows villages over mountains! It is women like you who drive men like me to the condition of husbands like yours! Ah! Oh. Oh. Are you saying that you're not going to help me? Hit her, Mochatkin! Strike her! I give you permission to beat her down, knock her down, send it to her! You hear? You hear how I'm abused? He would have you hit an orphaned mother! Have you heard me cough? Listen to no. this cough! Get your hands off oh. me! Help! Help! They're beating me! Oh, merciful God! I'm being beaten! I'm not beating you, I'm just holding your arm! Beat her, you fool! Take away your guts and chance! We'll never get that out of here! Somebody give her what she wants. Give her anything, only get her out of here. Twenty-four rubles and thirty-six kopecks. Not a penny more. That's all to me, and that's Ugh. all I want. Come with me, madam. I will get your money. And another ruble to get me home. I walk, but I have very weak ankles. <laughs> give her enough money for a taxi, only get her out. God bless you. You're a kind man. I remove the curse. Curse be gone! I need to run for take the Oh, God, my hair's falling out! Oh, sir, there's one more thing. I'll need a letter of recommendation so my husband can get another job. But don't bother yourself about it today. I'll be back in the morning. God bless you, sir. She's coming back. She's coming back. She's coming back. She's coming back. of my life came out with some affection. And yet, with all the characters I've shared with you tonight, I have a sense of betrayal. When I put down my pen at the end of the day's work, I cannot help but feel as if I've robbed my friends of their precious life fluid. What makes my conscience torment me even more is that I've had a wonderful time writing. But before I go, what was it we were talking about? 
early on, before the story of Chertikov? Oh, yes. I was going to tell you what it was, as a child, that I always wanted to do with my life. <coughs> well, funny. For the life of me, I can't remember. And yet, as I stand here with a feeling of great peace and contentment, I suspect, in some measure, I must already be doing it. Thank you for this visit. If you ever pass this way, please drop in. Good night. There is an alternate ending. If you ever pass this way again, I hope you inherit five million rubles! Thank you.